Hello. Okay. Calling the 7th of February 2024 meeting to order for the MSB. MS RBC. RBC. Mr. Shea. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot to cover today. It's uh, specifically some of the ice package things, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Let's take care of business first. I think we have a set of meeting notes that Jake sent out. I actually sent out two notes. Two notes. And I got um, one little spelling error, and um, I actually attached the schedule and budget to the meeting that we um, which we need to do, which we talked about. So with those two changes, yes. I'd like a motion from the committee. Yeah, when we'll, we we'll present information at the meeting. Mm -hmm. we'll Absolutely. Out. Okay. I make a motion to accept both sets of minutes as amended. Mr. Shea. Second. Mr. Shea, is that all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Aye. Why don't we jump right into someone else, something else. Let's just right jump into the ice package and Mike will present. Do you want, do I need to give you uh, privilege? Can you give it to me actually? I can pull it up on my computer. Do you want, while we're doing that, uh, Mike Morrison, Mr. Cancer Care, should I give a quick sure. summary of what's happening on site? Yep. To, uh, the folks on so, yeah, why don't we do that? Because let's update on the tank, the water line. Yep. So, just quickly on activities on site. So, uh, I think last time we talked, we talked about the oil tank and the kind of remediation effort that was underway. Uh, so, that, that effort has since Concluded for now, uh, we've stabilized the situation. The tank is moved. The immediate kind of risks associated with that have been remediated. Um, and right now, we've we've kind of filled the hole. <coughs> we've we've taken samples. Bill's uh, taken samples of the surrounding area to understand what's in the ground that we'll have to deal with. Um, you know, at, at a later date, it's, we've we've kind of got to a point where we continue with demolition. Take, take tests and samples to know how we deal with the, what's already in the ground. And then from there, once we get to that portion of the demolition when the foundations are out, it uh, makes more sense to go after some of that soil remediation. So that's where we're at with the, with the kind of the issue with the oil. Um, and, and, and we no, have, none, no evidence anything was got into like the pond or there was substantial. And we, have, right. and we have test results back for the stockpile so we can get those out of our way. Yep. So, uh, just so everyone knows, part of what we had to do to expose the tank, we had to excavate soil to get access to the tank. We stocked all that in the, you know, the driest, cleanest area that was available at that time when we had all that rain, which of course was was on the slab. Uh, so now we have that tested, so we can get rid of that material, so then we can remove the slab. So those results came back yes yesterday. Uh, so now we're working with. Uh, JDC to get a disposal facility lined up to be able to take that material. Um, You're going to do it on a unit price basis per ton, which is a typical way to do it. Mm -hmm. So that will include trucking and disposal. Most of the work on the site, except some of the emergency work, would be an additional service. What's the per ton price? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I don't know yet. Okay, I'm working on that. Got it. Sure. So Typical when we buy our site contracts, we'll have that built in. We yep. don't have it with the tank. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. It's going to be between 50. It's going to go probably to three up in New Hampshire. Yeah. So, so that's the that's the update there. Uh, we've also discussed that the last meetings, just where we're at with the with the actual abatement in the building itself. So there was two items that were uh, not included in the hazmat report, which we discovered. They were the, the ACM. Uh, specimen containing material that's a mastic at the high base structure where the low roof tied in. And then there was additional mastic found underneath the, the rink slab proper. So not the what we call the apron slab, the area around the rink, but the actual rink of the old initial ice sheet. Uh, underneath it had a black mastic with uh, an insulation layer. So between the insulation and the concrete was a, a black mastic. So that was also discovered, tested, and found to be um, hazardous containing material. So those materials that the plan associated with removing those materials has been submitted 
to the DEP. That's been approved. That's been put in our non-traditional work plan. Uh, so now we are set up with that non-traditional work plan. We've got approved from the DEP on our wheel watch and everything associated with it. And I believe today, Ian, we're starting with, with that, that work. So we had uh, another small, I would say, obstacle that kind of limited us to starting today, which was the Concord Ave uh, water, I wouldn't call it the main, but the, well, our, the feed to our site off of the main and Concord Ave between the main and our site, like within the street, failed on Thursday of last week. So there was water, and then people on, on town by saw there was water pushing up through the street at the curb line, essentially. Um, this is at a location of a previous patch. Uh, we met with the water department several times and the team several times, and we were essentially evaluating whether or not it made sense for the town, the project, to go after that line and fix it. It's an old line. Our understanding is it's not in the best condition, and at the end of this project, it goes away. So the question was, do we spend the time now and the energy now to kind of open up the street, peel everything back, fix this line, but we know as part of this project that service gets disconnected. These are the services that used to feed the Whitefield House and the, the rink. Um, the house adjacent. And the house adjacent, all those. Well, the house got turned down. Yep. Okay, yep. Once it comes into the sidewalk, there's a valve that branches towards the house, and then it went towards like field house in the um, in the rink. So, I think as as a team, we kind of bat around a couple ideas and landed on what we think is the best solution, where we're we're temporarily coming off a hydrant to support the last hopefully two weeks of demo. The hydrant, the closest hydrant, and the best hydrant for at least impact on Concord Ave and others is the hydrant at the high school by the turf field. So we're, we kind of developed a plan and we reviewed it with Dave, the fire department, water department, everybody to tap onto that hard hydrant, cut across the high school size at access road and run around the Harris field by the, by the MBTA track. Uh, we the, where the electric line is gonna go. Correct. Yep. So it's, it's crossing one sidewalk in the high school access road. Everywhere else we were proposing to come is crossing Concord Ave and the main sidewalk as people to come to well, what, what do you got a few hundred feet? <laughs> say 800 feet away. Wow. It's 800 feet away. So um, not ideal. It wasn't our first choice, but in terms of what we need to get done, the amount of water pressure we think we're going to be able to get, uh, and the uh, well, sure. kind of cost associated with be completely done. It's, it's probably the best option we had um, to be able to kind of get through the hurdle of demolition with the water support. Uh, until we get the permanent water line onto the site. So it's done two things. It's allowed us to keep moving, which is starting today. We still have anticipated a two week duration to get the last of the work, the foundations removed. So that's right now, we'll, well, it's it's best case two weeks. Um, you know, we want our committee to think if we're out there in three weeks, it's been a failure. That's our goal is two weeks, um, but we you know, working towards that. The um, and what it means is until we have the water source, that's going to be, if we need water or anything between now and then, when we get the water line in, we'll be approaching the team and say, hey, we need to reestablish this connection. And, uh, but, you know, it's kind of jumped up having that Concord Ave work to the front of our schedule once we get the site work. Uh, we wanted to get into Concord Ave and get that service onto our site. So it's just kind of resequence work that we already had planned uh, to prioritize it now that we but it, it limits us going after repair work that's eventually going to uh, go to the wayside. But Belmont Water would like us to connect at that location. Correct. Yep. So she's been evaluating whether or not the connection is made there or connection is made at the 12 inch, which is what we talked about before, which is a cottage street. So we need to evaluate both of those and Bill is taking charge on some of that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've started that and We'll we'll do this is a pinch today. We will run a more line on the cottage street, uh, but we think that's safer, more traditional work than uh, sleeving underneath that green alder. Um, One of the things I'd like to do is to is quote a twenty seven inch clay line pipe. That we'd have to go under or over. Mm -hmm. Can we get some invert shots on that, Jake? Maybe. 
if there's a if there's a manhole along there's a few front. manholes along the island. Okay. So there's 27 there. under under the island itself. The connection yeah. to the yeah. yeah. there, there are some this 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 handful of catch basins between the bridge and the um let's say cottage street. But uh, and there's probably two or three manholes that are I think they're on the uh, inbound, eastbound side of Concord Ave along that run. So we should be able to pop a cover and get that. Does it, Tom, did the town have any drawings on that? Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah. I, I know that there are record drawings of that culvert. Tony's meeting up this morning, oh, last yeah. afternoon, to get the uh, to get all of those plans. He's going to get both the culvert and the clay pipe, correct? That is correct. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I, I think you can go. Over, I think it's steep enough. Is my guess. If the clay pipe is draining the underpass at Concord Avenue, it's it got to be deeper. And I think also, just in general, we don't all things considered, if we're talking about avoiding a 27 inch clay pipe versus the culvert, there's a lot more options with the 27 inch pipe. Agreed. Correct. So, and, it's, but, and, it's, and I think it's low. I think yeah. the inverts of the two structures are close, is my guess. So we can have the drainage. Well, that's right. Without walking into the culvert. We, we can. And, what we're doing now, we're obviously buying site work. So what we're <clears throat> including uh, with some support from the group is, is a, a period of exploratory investigative work to do some test bits, see what's out there to make sure we're making the appropriate decision. Um, but yeah, I don't have any answer beyond what you're talking about. It's, it's in the works, but in the, the, the important part is- If Tony gets the plans, you'll have that data. Then if we're gonna take test bits, we can figure out that. Okay, that makes sense. Could you also get some dollars Estimate from AEC for the ring slab. Ring slab demo should be in its price, but we should have a cost for disposal, which should be the same as the cost for disposal of the walls and dressing rooms. Rooms. So I think the no, not the foundations, the walls and dressing room, which well, have the have the vermiculite, which is ACM, right? My understanding from talking to them, and I'll get clarity on it, the contract documents and the spec provided from Universal, they included concrete removal as ACM, I'll quote it, for foundation mastic, they, they told us to assume a quantity. So they gave us unit rates. So I think we okay. have those so units. I think we have those units. Yeah. So we're, we're working through the effort of kind of coming up with a tonnage to, to estimate to give a value. Okay, we think that's right. Okay, because what that's interesting that that was in the contract because we dug test pits along the foundation. And there were no, there was no master. They typically provide the unit rates in spec. Okay, that's fine. If they got it, that's even better. <laughs> so the demo is on them, but the, the premium to remove it as ACM is what we're talking about. But the actual yeah. work and the de and the disposal is already the unit price. Yeah. yeah, there may be more premiums associated with handling it. I don't know. Not in terms of what it could, yes. Yeah. Mark, can I follow up? Oh, you know, can I follow up on that? So it sounds like there's been three surprises in the last couple of weeks that all have some costs associated with them, right? One is the mastic that it has asbestos containing material that needs to go to two test. locations. Two locations. Okay. Is so that one's we're gonna have we're gonna try to get an estimate on. Then you've got the oil mitigation or the whole oil uh, tank yep. challenges. And then we've got this water main rework, which you have a vague sense of order of magnitude for those three so, as we think about its implication on the project cost. Yeah, so I kind of anticipated this question. <laughs> so we for me or like no, yeah. just in general. So I know in the high school, right, we have our total exposure log. Yeah. And we, what we come up with what we think it's and I want to make sure this can be understanding what our total exposure log is we hear something that's based on awarded work, not things that might be in the estimate, but on awarded work that we think is going to be a change order. We we put it on the exposure log, just says like, hey, we think this might come down the pipe. We don't know what it's worth, but it's tracked. And then we, we work to add values to that list as we learn more. So we have that list. Eventually this list is going to work into the, the CHA list similar to a way we're not there yet. And that's that's more of a Skanska handoff to the CHA that hasn't happened. But we have the list and we're working towards it. So the things that you just mentioned, the uh, mastic on the CMU, the mastic on the under slab of the rink, Oil remediation, the removal of the soil on top of the slab. Uh, so the water line, we, we have those and we're working to put the values in that makes sense. But I think, you know, for the up until yesterday, the value for the 
borderline remediation was a lot bigger because we thought we were opening up Concord Ave, going down, patching the waterline, and moving it back. So we're not in a position to share that piece yet, but I, I understand the, the request and we, we have the list. We just need to get the right copies of before we publish it for this group. Is that like next week yes. timeline? Okay. Yeah. Ideally, if you could have it by next week, <laughs> because Dawn would be presenting, Dawn's going to try to present his CHA like every two weeks. Yes. That's kind of the, have it next week. That's kind of our timeline. So we know right. we're trying to make sure we have the okay. information to handle so he can put it in his budget for the yeah. group. Thank you. Okay. The only other piece that's kind of out there in it gets it gets into the site work package is poll 13a which is an existing poll that is on the maxim property mm -hmm. we always talked about maybe running the data systems data wiring to that pole coming down the pole underground to the rink which works in the permanent condition but it may not work in temporary condition it doesn't work in temporary condition the other is, and Tony was looking into this, is that poll appears to have, I went there yesterday, a feed from underground from a manhole in Concord Avenue or Comcast going to the pole, up the pole, and then running back overhead to Carter Street. So it's not the overhead coming from Carter Street to the pole. <coughs> That's what everyone, I think, thought it was. It's going the opposite. It appears to go the opposite direction. So if we were to, uh, to say there was plans to remove that, we'd have to come up with a plan to connect that feed back to cottage. Correct. So maybe I mean, yesterday I walked in site with Ian and yeah. Tony, and it would appear to me to drop a pole in, and I'll, ask, I'll defer to David, is if we drop a pole in somewhere near the, called the Brick Plaza, somewhere in that area, and come off the median in Concord Avenue, where the data that exists, to that pole, and then we can go from there to Harris or down the pole and then feed the rink and Harris from that pole. But we need something on this side of Concord Avenue to get across Concord Avenue overhead, which used to be overhead to the Whitefield House. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's, we don't need to answer that today, David, but I think we need to think about, because when you walk that site, <clears throat> we don't want the pole where it is for Skanska's trailer, it puts it right in the middle of the green space. So I think we want to put it probably near the walkway or along that fence line that exists today, which is going to remain. And there's no way of piggybacking that with the temporary service that you put in? That's what I'd like to do. That's, that's the next question. We need to go back to Belmont Light. Can we, in fact, put the pole in, run temporary power? And yes. they have to, that has to come down to ground because they're saying they need a ground-mounted transformer to feed the silver box. So I need, that that's for another that's for next week, but we'll figure that one out. All right. Can you run the wire through the abandoned water line? No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do the street. <laughs> uh, abandoned that. He's, okay. Just so shut up. Does that ground mount to transformer have to be on a slab with ballards and like does this become a huge thing? I just put I put yours batteries on. For, for, it's just temporary. It's temporary. Got it, got it, Which I thought they said they had a temporary transform, and I, I don't know. Now they're telling me they don't have a tra temporary transform. We need, to, we need to sort that out a little more, all right? Okay. Okay. So the only other thing I'd just give us an update is we're working through our awards. We're going to talk at length about the um, nice package. Nice package, but concrete. We have an RTA drafted that we hope to kind of present at the OEC group level um, before it comes to the full building committee. Um, and then, you know, the metal building is ongoing. Site work is, is being pushed out based on the conversations we're having. So there's there's a lot of uh, procurement happening on our end, uh, which is good, which is where we want to be. And, and the site package is ready to go on the street? Uh, just about. So we have the, the scope pieces. I don't want to get in there, uh, but it should be on the street this week. And I also asked Dawn the status of the electrical package. And the only thing that was holding him up was the low voltage. And we went through that yesterday. And I think he's all, all set there. The two packages ought to go together, mm -hmm. not, but get on the street together. They're different bids. 
but you can't do a lot of earthwork or site work without the electric package. Yeah. Yep. So I think the low voltage and the electrical are all kind of combined into that one electrical package. So it's that makes sense, Jay. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, I think they I think they both go under the electrical file so better. It's a the electrician the electrician's gonna carry a low voltage shop. He has to right. so he can his purview read the spec. So it's all one package. Yeah. It, the low voltage stuff doesn't come until much later, yeah. but it's in the package. But we need to get an electric sub on so we can put conduit in underground. Yep. Yep. Okay. So. Especially if we're talking yeah. about this pole down the pole to the silver box. And this all remember is March 15th. I'm yeah. Thinking. So I just wanted to check on that if I could, <clears throat> Tom Caputo. So, Mike, thank you. You sent around the dates last time after the meeting. Are we still on track for all of those dates? So, on our end, we got the drawings that, that deliverable from TGAS or the MEP drawings yeah. that Friday that came. Documents available to qualified bidders on the fifth. Okay. That, so, that was on the second. The first, I'm sorry, the second. The first yeah. action item was. Get the drawings from TGAS. Yeah. Uh, that's triggered us to update our exhibits to then hit the the addendum date on our end. See, there's a date for the first published addendum. The 19th. Yep. So yep. we're working towards using those drawings, making sure our documents are up to date and our scope sheets reflect what's on there. Hit that addendum date. I don't know if Tom or Don are on. Oh, yes. Yeah. To be able to speak to the, the, the MEP set actually being available to bidders and project dog or where we stand with that process. Tom's on, um, Don is working on that. I believe it's all teed up and ready to go. Um, yeah, but I'll confirm that. That one was supposed to be February 5th, right? That was the, that's what we had in our schedule. I think if we're, if we're hitting, you know, that's what we had at the schedule date, but I think all, for the most part, we're within more the, key, the key oh, one there, yeah. Tom, is the electrical package needs to get out. The mechanical package, is, if it slipped over, well, that's not the end of the world. Okay. I just I want to make sure we put the dates out there. We check back on the yeah. dates. No, like, we're yeah. tracking yeah. against the dates. Like, I think we just, it should be part of this weekly process is that we're working to make sure that we're on track. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That'll be our job. What's the magic on March 15th? March 15th. You said something has to be done by March 15th. We need power and data to the Harris Field on March 15th for the high school to start using Harris Field. Okay. So spring sports. Spring sports. Yeah. Spring sports starts yeah. on March 15th. Got it. The games all... probably don't start until sometime in early yeah. April. Yeah. Yeah. So if the data is, but we, they Got start it. practicing yeah. and they start using it at night. Got it. Got it. Mark, Mark uh, Dante Mazzioli, I'm concerned that we've we've been through this for like three weeks on this. March 15th date, we don't have a number for the electrical, we don't have a number for the generator. I think it can we get a hard date that we like next Wednesday that we can have all this information so we can make a decision on this because okay, it seems like we're back, putting ourselves a little bit in the corner here on this and I think we need to get make a decision on that. Do we have a generator uh, price on that? Uh, we don't we Belmont Light originally told us they had a, uh, a temporary generator. Now we find out they don't have a temporary generator. I think it's important we fill the blanks in on this so we can make a, a decision on this as soon as possible. We uh, we met internally this week. I think I don't know if we've asked it yet. Uh, but one of the things we're going to need to get that generator sized is, or would like to have, is the the builds from that meter that show the usage. It's going to help us pick the appropriate generator to to run that silver box is meter right on it. I'm hoping we can get some reading somehow. Um, that should be DPW. We have an electric light. 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 But I, I don't think we had to calculate that load over there. It's just the, load. The, the, the load was provided by uh, CES. The, the load is provided. This is Jake Chudina Skanska. Um, so we could size it to that, but it might be oversized for the actual usage. So we, so we have a yeah, discussion. Just, just one point. There's, there's two real usages. There's a usage that on a daily basis they run the lights from dusk till at this time of year, I think it's nine o'clock. In the summer, they run them to 10 o'clock. So that's one, but they only light four, four small poles, two at each end of the field. 
And when they have a game or something like that, they light the whole place up. So that's when you have the big power surge that you're going to need to make sure we sides generate for. So you can't just look at, say, okay, we, the normal is this, because when they light the whole field, it's a whole different ballgame. All right. So let's make sure we get it. But thank you, Dante. That, that makes sense. Let's see what we can do. Okay, guys. Okay. Um, now we're on. Jake, yeah, uh, screen. Jim, and I get made you co host. Yes. Yeah, are you going to need to be co host also? Probably. I just do it. Thanks. I don't know that I need to share anything specifically today. Okay. All right. So, Jake, I'm going to cut this off, but Jake has a lot of. Uh, uh, knowledge here, but I'm going to set the table of what we're just looking at. So first on the top of the screen are our options. And I don't know if everyone has seen where well, at least in this room. I'm sorry, Ted, but the, Ted is CO2. Ted, the, <laughs> third, the third column is CO2 right now is where the camera uh lives on the, our screen. But if if you're seeing that the third column is the CO2 system, which is um which is the alternate system we're exploring today. So right now that first call on the basis of design, uh, that R410A, that is what's in the plan specs, what was estimated, that is the actual system that, you know, take the EPA regulations and all the other things we were, we're talking about out of the picture, that would be what we'd be presenting and be leveling to on a typical RTA. This is not a typical RTA because we're really not comparing bids of equal Scope, we're comparing different scopes. So that first call, that first call. These are actual quotes. These are actual quotes. Thank you. So they're in you know, and you drop the third bidder. Right. We do we do we have more bidders here. These are the these are the lowest per right, category. The lowest per category. Yep. And I, I do want to say that the budgets here, I mean the costs are inclusive of some of our allowances and holds. We pulled the ones out that are specific to each system for discussion purposes, but there's the that's an all-in number the total cost we're looking at i guess it's a plan okay for us. um so the first column is the base of the design the second column is a alternate proposed by a combination of one of our bidders with with discussions with the design team it's it's a newer system that would kind of meet the thresholds that are going to change in january 2025 and the third column is co2 which is again not based on plans and specs. It's based on um, delivering ice and providing a system similar to what is shown on the arcs. So it's not it's not what we can kind of level to or, or descope. It's their system that does what they are telling us is equivalent to the basis of design system. Um, all that being said, the, the cost is is shown right below the budget. So the top line is what we have in the budget. Um, for the scope, um, do we have a, a baseline cost? And then we have additional ventilation allowances below the line. That 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 is an allowance because we don't exactly know what that is. We know the basis of design doesn't need any more than what's shown on the drawings. The other two options, we we know that there will be changes to the design to facilitate those options. We don't know what they are quite yet. From discussions with the bidders, we have an idea of what might need to change. And that's what we try to capture in that allowance value. So until it gets fully flushed out, that's an allowance and we don't know the, the true extent. <laughs> the variance is the um, the delta between our budget and the, the proposed solution. Of the bottom of the lot, bottom portion, Jake, maybe you want to take that bottom portion, those last three rows in terms of what they mean. And Yeah, so the threshold that Mike this is Jake Chidino of Skanska. The threshold that's changing in 2025 that Mike mentioned is uh, the EPA is changing the threshold of global, global warming potential for refrigerants used, and they're dropping it down to nothing can be installed that is more than 700. So as you can see, the R410A basis of design is way over that. Um, through discussions with the bidders, we won't have any issue installing that it would be more issues serviceability maintenance down the line that's kind of unknown um both other options are below the 700 threshold 
but as we know that um, EPA can change that in in the future. Uh, I'll go down to the next one, which is before you go there, Jake. Yeah. Just so everybody's aware, is the state of California recommended the EPA to make that number one hundred and fifty. The state of New York recommended the G. MP or GWP to be 50. The EPA let it stay, it reduced it from where it was down to 700. And I think that's what you're getting to, Jake. What does the EPA do next? Is it two years, three years? Reduce that number is going to always be going down. And it seems like what we've, what we've been able to validate from what we've heard, there are other states that are already below the EPA threshold and what they're required. So the EPA is kind of like the standard. And states like California and New York are already pushing that to have a standard below that threshold. Um, so that's. Is anyone mandating replacement or is everybody saying no new system? So once no your system's system. in, it's unlikely you have to replace. Yeah. To that point, some of the, to Jake's eloquent CJ, to that point, some of these refrigerants already are $50 a pound, whereas CO2 is a dollar a pound. So you're saying it right. becomes harder to service them, yeah. then it becomes harder to procure the, procure the banned free um, refrigerant. Correct. But it, it, we don't have you don't you're not required by regulation to replace the entire Some of them cannot. No, they, they, cannot. they cannot make like today, or come January first, they cannot no one can produce 410A. Right. You have to buy it from someone who already has used it. Yeah. So you're buying a used product. So, so the other thing we want to mention is that it's for those of you that are familiar with rinks, and I think there are a lot of people here that are, it's no, it's very similar to the R22 system. So the R22 system was phased out. There are a lot of rinks still functioning today with R22. It's not an impossible, you know, it, it's not like someone has to go and re renovate all the R22 rinks tomorrow because of this regulation change. It's just they're they're now within that threshold of a system that is using a and, 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 and an end of life refrigerator. Yeah, but just so we're clear, the R22 that Mike is talking about is what was in the old rink. Right. And we had canisters of that in the rink. Right. From 50 years ago. When they put it in. Well, no, we had. We, they were I know, replaced, but it, it was a 50 year old system. 50 right. year old, 50, 60 year old system. That's yeah. right. Do we, do we know the annual operating cost of each of these? So we'll we get to that. Okay. Sorry. Um, so the so the next the last two rows there unknown in infrastructure revisions and schedule impacts. Uh, these are hard to quantify because they are unknown. Working with working off of different systems that aren't the basis of design, but we we just kind of showed that the basis of design wouldn't require any unknown infrastructure revisions or schedule impacts. Um, the the R four fifty four B. The, the middle column would be minimal uh, schedule and infrastructure revisions, and the, the SIMCO would be the most. That's the most unknown as well. So one thing I do want to know about the R454B system. <clears throat> so we're, we're talking about the 410, which is the tried and true. That's in a lot of ranks. That's something that people have done. The 454B is, is really a response to the code change. It's a it's a newer technology as well. There's not another rank we can go visit with our 454 system installed and functioning. It's currently, um, you know, it's being developed as we speak to respond to this. So it's it's not it's not a known commodity either. I just want to put that out there. There there are other parts of that that you know we still haven't flushed out. Which is why there's still a risk. So so the two on the right are, are, are brand new. If, but, there's, no, but I think, no. you know, and I don't want to, if George or Terry are on, they could probably speak oh, okay. to the, the middle section first, but. Can you guys hear me? This is George. Yep. Go ahead, George. So the uh, R454B cube, I had spoke with Andy at Emerald's Technol Emerald Environmental on this. They're past the R&D stage of this and getting you all approval on the unit. The characteristics of the R454B uh, performance wise are very similar to the 410 so it's not that much of a change within the unit besides some 
um, the plates and the heat exchanger and, and whatnot, but it's not like it's a, a total redesign of the unit. Gotcha. That's helpful. Okay. So, George, can I ask, um, so can we kind of comfortably say that the, the only real change that is unknown still, or a known unknown for the R54B would be the added ventilation? That's correct. And, and there would, we, we're not foreseeing any other infrastructure changes besides the added ventilation that would need right. to be uh, designed. The size is the same of the system, so the room wouldn't have to change. Um, it still can provide air conditioning to the facility, just like the R410A unit. Um, the only thing is, since it's an A2L refrigerant, it does require that uh, uh, somebody does a design on ventilation of the room. Mm -hmm. so, and it still would be, George, it would still be six cubes or five cubes? It would be the same setup of cubes, yes. Okay. It would be okay. one small cube for part load during air conditioning in five large cubes, that, uh, two of them would provide air conditioning. Okay. <laughs> Tom, Tom, Peter, thank you. Um, so now, we one thing that I did ask, and, and, and I, I want everybody to be aware, I don't know who is a service company in the locality around here that can service a CO2 plant. I've had that discussion. Okay, with whom, yeah. So, so can I ask a question about the, the, uh, the R454B? In one hand, I'm hearing that it's brand new, never been installed, you know, which is a little scary. On the other hand, it sounds like it's just a modification of existing mechanical with the different fluid. Like, where is it on that spectrum? Should we have any concern about the fact that we're putting potentially a brand new product into the building? Or is it? I can speak for my, this is my personal uh, so we were Mike, Morrison. Mike Morrison was cancer. So I, I am very confident that, that George and his team are know exactly what they're talking about when it comes to the system and they, they they feel comfortable, I feel comfortable. But I will say when I we asked for a schematic of this machine, it was not available and would be available to the end of this month. And it was going through UL S. So me, as someone who's trying to buy this, that that it's be a little uneasy. It's not. It's not like it's a system that we have that I can get a cut sheet on. So that that I'm not telling you how I feel. I, I completely agree. And, and, and George, is, if George feels comfortable with it, he knows way more about these systems than I. It, it, this this wouldn't change if it was a refrigerant system or a window or a piece of host. That's for, just for me trying to buy the system. And just to be clear, is your concern schedule? In other words, oh my goodness, we lose three months because we didn't get something we thought we would because they're waiting for UL approval? Or is it we have a totally unknown product that you wouldn't want to be installing in the building? No, and it's scheduled. It's my, my concern okay. is, is scheduled because I've, we also asked, you know, these would be concurrent things. So we don't have to wait for the UL listing. We can do that concurrent as we're procuring the machine and as we're, we're getting the approvals. That, that's concurrent schedule. But just so what so why in the schedule impact is that the least and co2 is the most because we don't know what type of design changes are associated with the co2 that's that was the that was so the, the design change is not getting the correct. because they gave you a schedule or for the pieces yes okay yep it's more the front end and, okay. it, it, and what we're hearing the and what george has said and the contractor has said that the from the building the unit and Getting it here on site is really no change. It's, it's just the, the front end piece. Okay. Dante has his hand up. One second. You got it. Uh, Dante Mazzioli. So uh, it might be a little pre early to say this, but based on listening to the information yesterday and being up in Toronto over the weekend and talking to a couple of people about this, who uh, I guess not, from my understanding, Canada um, has used the CO2 system a lot more than the US has based on uh, EPA numbers coming down, coming down, coming down, and that is, I, I would be nervous about putting the R45B uh, system, R45 system in based on, you know, we're building the rink here. We're putting solar panels on the roof because we're trying to impact the global warming potential. 
uh, it seems that we're we're obliged to to do the best we can and running with new technology. Uh, the CO two seems like it's a, it's a lot of cost associated with it. But what's the uh, aren't we really concerned here with impact to the environment that, that we're putting all these panels on the roof and we're trying to do zero net energy and we're trying to do all these things that you know that I think we're all concerned about. Uh, for me, the CO2 system, when I spoke to people in, that were involved with this in Canada, said it's widely used in Canada, and, and it's a solid system based on the numbers that I'm seeing uh, and the, the law that looks like it's going to change in 225. I, I would be strongly an advocate of putting the CO2 system in, uh, uh, and nothing tells me that uh, the world won't be at CO2 within a couple of years. And I'm concerned about getting parts for these other systems uh, that there, there's no motivation for a company to keep making these, these parts and be available to it. So I, I just want to go on record before we move forward that I'm a proponent of the CO2 and I'm concerned about the price, uh, but I'm also more concerned about the environment and the act that impact it has on it. Thank, thank you, Dante. Can we, Jake, go to potential savings so David understands that? And I have a table I can bring up. Uh, Some of the potential savings from the Freon systems to the CO2 system that so, was provided by Simcoe. So the only thing I can comfortably say about the potential operating costs is that it does appear that there will be savings with the CO2 system compared to the baseline. Um, all this information was provided by Simcoe, and we haven't been able to validate any of that. All we can really say is that it, it appears that there will be operational savings. Okay. So the information, just so the committee understands, from the information. Short, I, I disagree with that because somebody needs to figure out a maintenance cost impact. I know the CO2 system will cost more in maintenance than a cube system. We, we were. I, we are not in a position to say one will be better or worse from a maintenance operation cost. Oh, the information we were given said that this the Simco system would use less um, utilities than the other. Right. That's, that's what that is all we're, we're, that is all we're saying. Yeah, right now we're talking about just utility or energy costs, water and electricity, and the team here is going to do some more due diligence. And I'm going to assign Skanska to do more due diligence on the 454B. And the committee will take on doing some due diligence on the CO2. And we have, I started making some calls yesterday to places in the United States that have CO2 systems. In Canada, they have over 100. In Nova Scotia and Quebec have significant number of CO2 systems. So we'll make those calls. I'm going to work with David from facilities for the CO2, and Skanska can report back next week on the 454, <coughs> right? Mark, can you can you clarify? I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Jim Kraft with Skanska. Um, can you clarify what you're looking for Skanska to confirm versus I, I think some of this should be done by like engineering uh, type folks uh, to compare like maintenance or, or the cost of operation. That's not something that we typically do. We'd have to go like hire a consultant. Um, so uh, it might be appropriate to connect us or have us do it as a, in a team with uh, an engineering folks that you so recommend. Is, is this, okay, Jim, is this something George, you and Terry can do for the 454 system or maybe you already no, have it done? No, we, can, we have to have a, a third party energy consultant do a whole load calculation on the building as well as we need input from the town on when they're going to do resurfacings of the ice, what temperature the facility is going to be maintained at, what temperature the ice is going to be maintained at. Um, you, unless you had do all of that, it is it's no not a truthful document. I, I second. This is Ted Galante. I second. I second what George is saying. In order to really provide, um, you know thorough, clear information, you know, a, a lot of energy work and calculation and modeling would need to be done. Um, it does, you know, from a global warming reduction perspective, 
the CO2 system sounds like the best system and and it is the trend. Things are moving in that direction and and in, in 30 years probably most ice rinks are going to be in that in that direction. We don't have a way of providing an analysis between you know the the R410A which has the highest global warming potential potential or the R454B which has the middle and then the CO2 which which has the least. We are building a rink that is you know, the last rink that was built on this site stood there for 60 or 70 years from, you know, going from cars that were, were lead-based gas to electric vehicles. So we're, we're in a similar position where we're, our electric vehicles are the equivalent of lead-based gas and 50 or 60 years, we don't know where things are going to be. But the global warming potential is a big one. And I, I think I agree with you, Ted, but when, when I look at the list that Simcoe's provided and I see two NHL teams building new tractor facilities and both are using CO2, which it's kind of telling us something. I agree. I agree. I don't, I don't, I just, we just. That's why I'm saying we just need to do more due diligence, but to do a whole energy model and you can quote what the number is, but it's, it's significant to do a whole energy model for this building. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably... I mean, is, is there a simpler version where we talk to, I'm sorry, you, you go, no, go ahead. Is it, where, 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 where we talk to, 10 rinks that have this and then 10 rinks using traditional and we ask what their average utility bills are and we know that it is hopelessly imperfect, but, the, that, that, but you get a sample that lets you know, is this a 10% savings, a 50% savings or a 90% savings? Can we get to that? They, that they, they, may, they may not know the savings, but they can know what the energy use was. Yeah, yeah. What was it? And then can, can we do that comparison just to yes. get a ballpark? Because if this is like we say 5% in energy, well, the operating Anyway, no, I, sorry, I agree that that's where we want to go with it. It's going to be imperfect, but it's going to get us at least a piece of data. Some right. indication. Go ahead. Bill, I'll Bill Shea with the committee. So think, looking at this a little different. What I'm hearing, right, 100% of the rinks in the U.S. have this 410A system, more or less. Uh, no, 410 or 22 Okay. There's some so, ammonia-based rinks, too. So, or ammonia. Okay. Water, okay. Water, just give water town is an ammonia-based rink. Okay. It, are these people, let's say half the country's rinks, uh, this R410A, are they just going to go throw everything out or are they going to come up with some type of conversion system to modify that so they no, stay in business? They're going to continue using 410A until they yeah. replace their rink. So the, it, 410A is going to be around for a long time? Probably. Okay. I just, I, I, I feel more comfortable if any member of the team had installed an R54B or a CO2 prior. Any team, what, any one of our team? team, our team, anyone on the call. Oh, okay, the design team. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 right, anyone, or well, ScanScript can yeah. call someone, someone who can pick up the phone and say, is this right? As opposed to those two, we're, 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 we're gonna call and there's gonna be no one on the end of the phone. Well, you're correct. The calling asking about 454B, you're going to probably get crickets. Yeah. But we can certainly call about 410A and find out what their energy uses are. Because what we're hearing from George and Terry is it's very similar. So the energy use should, should be, be similar. So at least we can compare that. Okay. But the based, based on what Simcoe is providing, and they provided a study done in Canada for all these different rinks in Five or six different, they, they compare yep. ammonia with all of right. these different right. things, and some of it. Right. Been, essentially, what they're predicting is that we would save about 20 kilowatt hours a year okay. in, a, in electricity, and you tr save some amount of water because they don't use a water, water based chiller system. Okay. Cooling tower. Cooling tower. Thank you, Jake. I think the fact that Simcoe is using these rinks all through Canada, and there's a ton more rinks in Canada than, than there are in the U.S. Uh, it, and when I spoke to the gentleman up in Toronto, he says it's uh, you know he was emphatic about it was the only way to go. That and he mentioned the same thing that Mark said to me. There's two NHL rinks, uh, practice rinks that are going to that now, and he suggested that those other rinks wouldn't even be built anymore, uh, as far as he knew that. Uh, that everybody was moving away from it, that the uh, uh, the R45 was kind of a uh, 
you know, trying to step up the numbers from the R uh, uh, 10 a and, uh, and I think we're obliged to look at this technology, get a better assessment and make a, a you know, informative decision on which way we should go. We Correct. And that, that, that's, we're going to do some due diligence over the next week. And just one more piece of information, Bill, yes. is an unknown Ivy League college is replacing their current system, yep. which I suspect is a yep. pre-owned system. Yep. They're going to CO2. Okay. But also, in comparing with Canada for uh, cost of stuff, you know, their ambient temperature is probably 20 to 25 degrees below us. Mm -hmm. So that, that number's going to change. Mm -hmm. And, how, and how long do you run the ice? Right. right. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, up there, Dave lays on facilities. Up, up there, it's like they're probably running it 12 months out of the year. It's an entirely different hockey program up there. So the more you use it, the more savings you're going to generate from it. So, you know, it really is important to get the same question across the board. How big is your facility, square footage size, volume wise? How often do you run them? What's the insulation value of that building? Right. Uh, all these, that all these different that gets the energy model. Right. right. But if you're able to create some type of baseline and you say, all right, how many months are you using it? You know, break it down by the month or whatever. You should be able to. I mean, I, I'm a proponent of you know saving the earth and all that. Um, no matter which way you go, if you go the 45, uh, 4B, yeah, EPA is going to change it, um, change the numbers at some point in time. But you will still be able to use that system. The only difference is is the cost of that gas is probably going to increase just like the I-22 does now. I-22 right. is like gold. You can buy it, but you got to buy it almost off the black market. The body, right. Okay, so the same thing will happen 30, 40 years from now with that. <coughs> so, and can we also ask these people if they've shut down their rinks for four months and starting them back up? And what yeah, any implications of that? Correct. As opposed to and the ones they, that all through the year. Also, I want to know are they also using them for ACing the rink at the same yeah. during the winter? Yeah. Okay. I just, Mike Morris wants to answer this one more clarification. I think most of the people on the call know this, but maybe there's some that don't. Um, Simcoe as a company, they're they're promoting the CO2 system. They've been installing rinks in this area for a long time. This is just a new system for them. So it's not like they're unfamiliar with rinks. They've done rinks in this area. They've done rinks, but just not. They used to have a Boston office. Yes. So it's not like this is a brand new uh, field for them. It's just a new uh, infrastructure. They may have the comparison numbers we're after themselves. They, they do. They, they, they do send them. them. But well, I, can just, I can send those around to the committee. All right. Is there a way in which we might be able to negotiate some type of, this is going to be a show model or a, uh, give us a break so we'll, we will entertain and install this and they give us a cut in price for marketing value and marketing purposes? That's a great question. I've thought of that. The other I've thought about is would Belmont Electric provide some funding because these are heat pumps. They provide heat pumps to your house. We're reducing the cost. Oh, well, we also have rebates too. Sure. I don't know if you get a rebate on this, but that's a good question. Yes, that. And yes, I suppose we asked if there are rebates available. Let's wait for that. Okay. Great. So, from a committee standpoint. I'd like a, more of a straw poll, but you know we're not going to make a decision today. We're not going to vote on this today, but we do. We just wanted to put it on the table of where we are in this because it's a it's a it's a pretty big change and a lot of dollars associated with it. But I wanted to get a sense from the committee: is this something a, a road we want to go down further to really uh, analyze it? And you know so. Maybe a, I do a poll of what we have and, you know, or you can go yay or nay. How do you want to go, Bill? You're sitting here. Bill or Tom? Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear a, um, a summary from Ted's team, the rink team, based on, you know, the, the, the ups and downs of going to CO2, which is, seems to be where the group's going, and, and that's that's fine. But we, where it's new territory, I, I really... Think that they someone's got to reach out to someone and, and, and give some bullet points on okay. what we should should and should not deal with. That maybe they report out next week on that. Sure. Okay. Yep. George and Terry, can we plan on doing that? But I like to hear from the committee. Yep. Is do we do we poll the committee? Do we just 
I mean, yeah, I think you could probably just take general feedback. I mean, I'll, uh, being in the room, I'll, I'll give you mine. I mean, if, if you if the if you could get rid of that third line there about variance and cost, I, I, it does increasingly sound like CO two may make sense, and I think that's you know absolutely something we want to verify with some follow up follow up research in the next week or so. I think I keep coming back to though it's nine hundred thousand dollars more, correct? Right, and we have a project right now that as we try to get the is teetering, right? Is teetering, and we're starting to already consume a good portion of our contingency. So, I guess there's a question of even if it feels like it may be the better objectively option, if we don't have the budget to do it, you know, got to figure out how you how you solve that. And we're not going to do something that's penny wise, pound foolish for the town, but I'm not sure that's where we are. I think it's a question of, you know, so so yeah, I'm, I'm going to get committee meeting committee members comments first. Jim, and then I'll come back to you. Hey, Anne Marie. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, I appreciate saving the earth. I'm all for saving the earth. But I agree with Tom. I'm very, very concerned about this price tag on the CO2 and the fact that we don't have any data yet. Now, maybe we collect some, maybe we get something from Canada. Uh, I'm open minded to that. I think, as the, um, the, the energy cynic here, I think no matter what we go with, before we know it, it's going to be outdated. And I'm going to give you one silly example. Yesterday, I tried to replace some of the fluorescent tubes in my under counter cabinet uh, lighting in my kitchen. Guess what? I can't do it. They've been outlawed in Massachusetts as of last summer. The, su the suggestion was maybe I could drive to New Hampshire and buy some of these bulbs. So I'm, I'm faced with replacing the units under my cabinets because the bulbs have been outlawed, which is ridiculous. So I, I just think price is going to be a big driver for us here. And yes, I'm happy to save the earth, but if we don't have the money, we're not saving anything. Yeah, but, but that gets to what some people have raised, Anne-Marie, is if, depending on what the laws change, and you have a problem you know, 10, 15 years down the road and you have to replace the whole system, that, that's not a good sign either. So no, I totally agree. We have, to, we have to weigh all these things together. That's why I wanted to have a discussion today, gather more information, and then have some more discussion next week. Dan. I uh, just wanted to echo the same concern, but also as we're analyzing you know, utility and, and maintenance and other costs, would we be able to get some input on you know what else is coming around the corner because as we're thinking about eating up the the contingencies we have as a committee member i just don't know what what's the next item that we currently um view as kind of a potential uh, budget buster so that we can assess this against those that are coming down the road if we can good, good point dan based on the last two weeks i don't know the answer to that an oil leak and water leak. What else is next? Well, are we a week or so? Where are we? How far are we away from the re-estimate? <coughs> so we the are. The fifteenth is when we have the estimate. That's next um, week. That's next week, and that's you know. So yeah, we will have more information on that. I, and I want to, to Mark's point. You know, these are the bigger packages. We said before, abatement was the risk. We're in the middle of that now. Site work is the risk. We're Pretty much in the middle of that now. We'll have that pricing in. So I mean, it, it's kind of the this is where we're going to see most of the unknowns flesh out because it's a it's not part of the building. It's not a drawing anywhere that we can point to. So, okay, Danelle. Uh, this is Danelle Long. Um, I've been privy to some of these conversations uh, as part of the working group. And so I know the data is imperfect in terms of operational cost and future maintenance, but I think we will learn more that we can interpolate and and confidently know that there will be operational savings each year. Um, and whether this is like a 20, 30, $40,000 a year number, I don't know. But I think this does get tied into the bigger conversation of both what it means for the town and even maybe what it means for how we request funding or finance um, this uh, more forward-looking system. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's a bigger conversation of 
us, you know, trying to produce energy on the roof and yet using more energy inside the building where maybe we need to kind of reverse our thinking and start with using less energy in the building and then continue to produce. But um, so there might be some things that seem tough from the front end and initially, but um, just like a lot of these things over the last 20 years, when you do initial versus life cycle costs, um, some of it's, you know, going out on a limb and being the first to do things, but um, it, it's not dissimilar from this change of technology we've seen for environmental reasons over the last 20 years. And this is not even that um, uh, startling or new. It's, you know, proven in Canada for years. And there's a whole list of case studies in the U.S. that are in new buildings, like rightfully making this change. Um, and in one of the calls, like hearing... Um, you know, the NHL making ranks and taking the lead on this. Um, a lot of them already are moving toward this global warming potential of one, uh, using ammonia as zero, but for reasons you don't, we don't use that, you know, in this facility. Um, you know, I think it's, it's something we really need to understand. Uh, it's a like, why would we be doing something? And uh, why wouldn't we be doing something? So, uh, yeah, I think there's more to this conversation. I think it, it takes a little more time. Um, I think change is hard and there's a lot of comfort in using a known system um, by those who have used it, but there are a lot of other people who have used the CO2 as well. Thank okay. you. Anthony, thank you, Danelle. No, thanks. Um, so, I would, in the absence of cost, I would absolutely be a strong proponent for the um, CO2 system. I think that is the way of the future. It's the one just, I think it's the right way to go. CO2 will always be available. I mean, that's part of the problem we have. Um, I would absolutely avoid the R410A. Um, I think that you are right. It will be available, but it'll be recycled. So, you know, there's a little more R22 for people because we're, you know, our, our, the, the stuff from our rink is going to go to somebody else but the price skyrockets and the availability goes down over time. I think tying ourselves to something that's being phased out is a mistake. Um, so I, I guess if we can afford it, I'd really want to go CO2 um, and then we can consider that other R, I don't have the number in front of me, R450 something, 454. Um, well, we can 454. consider that, but that, yeah, that seems like the newest of the three. So CO2 is proven, not necessarily so much in the US, R410A is proven, but it's being phased out. And then I, I'm, the other is kind of intermediate in cost, and it seems a little bit unproven to me, but it is similar enough to R410. It's probably fine. Okay. I'd Thank like you. to hear more. Thank you, Anthony. Steve, Zella. <laughs> yes, uh, since we started this project a couple of years ago, we've seen changes in the energy code, the plumbing code, and the storm drainage code. And these all increased costs of the project that we didn't anticipate a couple of years ago. And uh, I'm a proponent of the CO2 system. I just think, yes, we have to do some more due diligence on it, operating costs, so on and so forth, and then let's make a group decision. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Frank French. Yes, um, thanks. A lot of a lot of you all have kind of said um, some of the things that I was going to say, but I, I am interested in you know learning more about the CO two system, and it seems like it would be is a way of the future, um, and seems like a prudent way to go. However, like everyone's saying, it's the it's the balance of the cost with with some of the you know overruns I'll use, or you know going into our contingencies already. So I'd be interested to see what would be the real offset of anything in the current program now, which I know there isn't much room to do anything to take out. Although I am interested in um, learning more about the CO2 and, and think it would be a, a prudent way to go, um, but just need to have a little more information. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Dante? Uh, I think I started this off by saying, uh, I really want to jump on the back of uh, Danelle and Steve Sala. Uh, I, I think the CO2 is the, is the way to go, uh, how we find that path and find out more information and get the cost uh, associated with running that building is, is an important thing to all of us. But I, I would hate to see us put a system in uh, and, 
and save a few bucks now and cost us more money in the future. I, I would hate to go back to the town eight or 10 years from now and say, you know, that system's antiquated. We can't get the parts and now we're going to go back to something that we had the opportunity to do. So let's get some more information. Let's put it out to others and see if we can make a strong case of moving in the CO2 direction. Thank you. Thank you, Dante. Catherine Oates. Hi, thank you. Yep, um, I agree with what a lot of has been said. Um, would like some more information um, to be presented uh, in a week or two so that we can have um, uh, a better decision. Uh, again, knowing that we will not get to perfection with more information, but we will get to a higher confidence level. But also very interested in, in, in seeing the operational costs uh, with each of the systems and what that implies for the overall town budget going forward. Yeah, Catherine, I'll send to you and the committee uh, some information that Simcoe sent around, and you can look at it from the energy standpoint, which you've looked at before for the PV. So that would be helpful. Sure. Okay, Jim. So um, just wanted to bring back up a, a reminder for folks to keep in mind as uh, as you're reviewing this, um, the amount of time that it takes to make this decision we've talked about in the past um which is time is money um so keep that in mind um i think we took the extra time to bring this simcoe into the fold so you've you've already spent some dollars uh extending the schedule to do that um i don't know how much more information you're going to have in a week or, or how long it's you think it's going to take to get comfortable but uh sometimes you have to make a decision a tough decision uh faster is it better than spending more money um every week as we move along so, yeah I, I would i would echo that jim because i think I, I think on our side you know in order to get consultants to do research and start chasing a new design approach um it, it's going to take them some time but it's also going to ask for additional compensation so we're going to have to talk this through i mean huge proponent of getting the CO2 system in, um, but, but it's got some, uh, some some other parts and pieces that we have to figure out. Uh, one, one second, Bill. Yeah. Danelle? And so with that, I appreciate um, the charge. And I think as a committee, we need to work quickly. Um, but, you know, this EPA change has put this in front of us and we need to do the right thing. And I don't want others to be overly worried about the schedule when we've had been dealing with other <coughs> schedule implications. Um, so I, I think um, we've heard from in some of the working group calls um, from CES, your consultant, Ted, that yep. You know he's comfortable. He there will be some work to do, but again, let's we keep this in. You know the perspective that there changes come along here, but there might be a reason we need to do it. So um, let's just work quickly. Um, let's keep setting benchmarks and deadlines to get our stuff done. And this is just another one of those. So um, that's my encouragement. Bill Shea. I'm not set. I'm set. Bill Shea is all set. Okay. I've got a lot of input. Thank you very much from the committee. Um, and I will continue on with the due diligence. Um, I'm hearing from Ted's group that short of an engineer, engineer, engineering model or an energy model, uh, they can't really do much. So it sounds like it's going to fall on the committee to do the due diligence, both the Freon system and the CO2 system. And we'll have to figure out how that works. Mike Morris. Uh, if we're done with that conversation, there's a couple other easier discussions related to this package we'd like well, to have. easier discussions. I, I, at least I think, maybe, potentially. Um, and they're on the next two slides, Jake, if you want to. Yes. Um, Before we jump to CO2, I just wanted to touch on some points in the Simcoe D scope, uh, just to note to the committee that there was a uh, maintenance contractor who is local and he said that all the uh, like you said all the grocery stores use this so and co2 rings have kind of i did a little bit 
and we're kind of in the big thing since the Beijing old days. So Co correct. The, the other is, is Simcoe has a facility in Connecticut, which is three hours away. They are local, and the local rep they're going to have here is the same rep that currently is does Belmont and Belmont Hill School. Yep. And he doesn't see it as, as a no, he has major issue. Things. He has some good things to say. Correct. But Belmont Hill doesn't have to see it too. Yeah. No, but he's the same. We, we, at least we know this person, okay. we, that we've dealt with this yep. person before, but I'm they sure have a facility that if they have a call. The it's other good. is, Simco was so large of a supplier for right. rice rinks, right. they have their make, manufacture their own parts, they manufacture, so if they need a part, they're going to reach out to Toronto and get the part. Okay. okay, go ahead. So with the, with the award or the, the buy of this package there are a couple alternates listed that we were evaluating the pricing um, some of these alternates were uh included as deduct alternates as a you know a way to reduce costs if we needed to and some were add alternates and those were more seen as the nice to haves rather than the, the ones that were uh, thought to be important so this one here it's a Deduct alternate, so this nine thousand four hundred dollars, and that's an average of the bidders we received. Uh, that's included in the number we have uh, and presented. Uh, it's for the curb glass at the boards. It's a alternate in the bids now, um, and I think we're just trying to get the temperature of the committee. If that's the intent is for ten thousand dollars to keep that into the, the award. Uh, just so the committee all understands this, the old ranks. Essentially, just had a poll at the end of the boards. The newer ranks are now going to a curved section, and it's called a Shara poll because he put a check onto someone that put this head right into the poll. So, would they now go to this curved glass, which is a safety issue? And I think for ten thousand dollars to build a new rink, we should be having curved glass. Motion to install the curved glass. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you, Mike. Next. That was easy that was and and can, before you leave that. Mm -hmm. Ted, are those our stands that I see in the background of this picture? <laughs> I just pulled that picture off the. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I think we all wish they were, Mark. Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> along with the LED signs. There you go. All right. Um, the next two are, are smaller in value. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. The one is for on the spectator side to go with the seamless glass, and that's what's shown in the top. Um, so, in the for. $3,500 premium, we can have what's viewed at the top of the screen along the bleacher side versus what is more traditional glass and boards on the bottom picture. Motion for the seamless glass. No, before you, before you go there, it's, I, have, I have a question. And, and I, maybe we don't have an answer to this, and maybe George or Terry can ask, answer this. From a maintenance standpoint, is the seamless glass more susceptible to damage than the ones with the aluminum post stanchions? stanchions? Is Terry and George still on? So Ted, could you could you reach out to them and ask them that question? You yeah, know, I'm, just, I'm just I'm just concerned that all you have on the seamless, and I know all most of the rinks in the NHL have the seamless, but all you have is a clip at the top. Right. Is that you know, I I suspect at a high school rink it probably doesn't have that big a deal, but. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's. Um, I'll reach out and ask the question. I, I don't think. But, but this was for the committee. This is only along the in front of the bleachers. Correct. Correct. And it's three thousand, yeah, four thousand dollars. So like mid game, someone gets <laughs> shut. Glass starts popping out. What's it going to take to to replace it? To replace it, one guy because I don't think you're going to have a whole team during a game. So how are you going to do this? Correct. That's what, that's what I'm asking. That's yeah, before I... yeah, should we have a price for the whole entire rink to look like the top picture just to get the uh, cost associated with it? I don't, I wouldn't suggest it to be any more. Um, I think it's more of a convenience thing than it is going to be damaged more than the other post. This is newer technology at the top than it is at the bottom. The more, the bottom is a more traditional thing, but it, some of the newer rinks um, that I go in with the, with my grandkids, the, the top rink looks, that's what that's what they're all going to. Can we get a cost just on the whole entire rink to look like that? Well, why, would, why would you care about doing the whole rink when spectator is really only, I mean, you're only going to really see it 
where the bleachers are. I would I would echo Dante's Dante's vision of seeing the the um, you know the only reason the glass is there is to protect people from getting hit with flying pucks. The idea is to have it as clear and open as possible, um, and having it seamless would be the preferred way all the way around because people are going to be seeing this from all sides, and the rink will seem very different, perceptually different, without millions than it would with millions. Yeah, and, and all due respect, Thomas, uh, I don't know when the last time I've sat in the bleachers to watch a high school game. Uh, most people, a lot of people like to stand at the ends of the, the rink, and they won't be able to stay at the far end, but the uh, they'll be able to stay at the close end where the offices are and stuff like that. So I, I, I would be surprised why we wouldn't want to put better visibility in there. I don't, I, the rinks at, uh, in Rockland and stuff like that have that top section, so I, I based on 3400 uh, it doesn't seem like a lot so i'd like to at least get a comparison price on uh, the whole range of uh, visibility okay jake did you flip me these slides yesterday is that the email i got i wanted to send it to terry uh yeah i think i think i did we can Thank make you. sure you have them ted if you don't okay and then the next one jake is the soft yeah the soft cap uh it's really just a softer nosing on the edge of the, the boards at the bottom of the glass. That was $10,000. That's an ad of 10000 yes. It varied. It really I, put, I put that on an alt. Personally, I put that on an alternate. If someone has a yeah. page of piece. I agree. I agree. I'd, like, I'd like to go somewhere and see that. And I also, I'm concerned about, you raised it, Muzzy, uh, the maintenance and the and how that holds up over time is I got a little concerned. And, and how it affects the game. I mean, the game hits the top of the dash and the puck bounces. Where does the puck do on that? I've, I've never seen it. And we asked Terry that question on the work uh, call yesterday. Terry said he doesn't know anybody that's using it yet. So based on that, uh, I don't think we need to spend ten thousand uh, dollars. Though it, it does seem like it has some kind of safety impact certainly but I, I just see it seems that that's a flexible piece of, of rubber or plastic that's another maintenance headache uh, that we're going to really need i don't think we need to do that okay i agree we'll carry that as an alternate yep that makes sense so we uh, got our mark choice okay anything else okay that's it i think that's it for our side anybody have any new business See any hands raised? Thank you very much. And we'll report back out of our due diligence from this week. Next week, we'll be on same time, same station. Thank you very much. Uh, motion to adjourn, Mr. Shea. Motion to adjourn. Mr. Mazzioli. Second. All in favor? Uh, uh, thank, thank you all. Next week. Thank you. Thank you now. Bye,